Okay, this is a lecture for my fifth hour class on the 21st of February. All right, so we're going to talk about sports. You know, one of the, I told you a long time ago when we started talking about the Gilded Age that almost everything you see in modern American culture, I don't care if you're talking about labor unions or automobiles or telephones, directly comes directly from the Gilded Age. In a lot of ways, from 1865, that's the end of the Civil War, to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the country that you live in today was uh, created. Okay, and one of the things uh, that we that, that come out of the Gilded Age is uh, professional and college sports. And I don't think I have to tell you. Uh, how obsessed we are as a nation, and I'm not saying that is a bad thing, how obsessed we are with sports, just we're still in the shadow of the Super Bowl. You know the, you know what the number one television show is in Japan? The Super Bowl. I mean, it's not just this country. We export, we export sports just like we export wheat. <coughs> so, and it's a multi-trillion dollar uh, uh, industry today, and that's what sports consist of. I mean, how much? Who was the winning quarterback in the Super Bowl? Patrick. How much do you think he gets paid to run around? How much? I think four hundred fifty million. Four hundred fifty million over a ten-year period or something. Yeah, yeah forty-five. Did you live on forty-five million dollars? Yeah. Well, you better start throwing the football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to, pl to play a to play a boys' game. He throws that ball and he gets paid. He's richer than God. He gets paid a ton of money, okay? Um, and so sports is a huge industry. And, of course, people have passion about their sports teams. Uh, so here's the first thing I want you to write about the invention of sports. And remember this. Baseball had to be invented just like that light bulb up there had to be invented. Didn't descend out of heaven, nine people throwing a ball and hitting it. So here's the first note that I want you to write down about sports. The New York Yankees, the New York Yankees are the greatest team in the history of organized sports. Does everybody have that down? Yeah. What are you doing that for? Are you talking about your grade? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> because, you know, I'm the person. That, anyway. And I'll say that again. The New York Yankees is the greatest team in the history of organized sports. You might want to write that down twice so you remember. And then I want you to write down Boston sucks. Write that down. Yeah. Okay. So there are the New York Yankees. You see that? It's an original. Good. You see that? Good. Evil. Good. Understand that? Evil. One more time. I'm enjoying this. Good. Evil. Okay. Coach Green, you might ask him about Boston. He's a Boston Red Sox fan, which proves that when he was a young child, he was dropped on his head. But anyway, I don't know how you are for Boston. Anybody in here a Boston fan? Is there a Boston fan in the house? Because I want to give you, are you a Boston fan? Okay. Well, put your head down. You've learned enough. You can't tell me that. I don't believe that. I think you're just raising your hand. You're, your dad wasn't a Boston fan. He was a good student. Okay. I guess it skips a generation. Anyway. Well, baseball, write this down, by the time of the Gilded Age, became known as the National Pastime, and it's still called the National Pastime. I'll ask you tomorrow which sport is called the National Pastime. That means it was the favorite sport of America. And from about uh, 1882, uh, well, from about 1876, and we'll get back to that in a moment, until the 1960s, when I was a wee lad, baseball was the number one sport in America. What do you think the number one sport in America? They still call baseball America's pastime. But what do you think the number is? The baseball the number one sport in America today? What is? Football. Football. Not, you know, we're coming up on March Madness. It's not It's not college basketball. Still think it's football, college football? I think you may be right, college football. Anyway, look, baseball, 
actually started in about 1500, about 500 years ago. It came to us from an English-Irish game. They played it in England not when Henry VIII, it was the 1500s, he was the king of England. They played a game called rounders. And rounders had four bases and it had nine players and it had a leather covered ball and it had a stick that people hit the ball with. Now the English also have cricket. But it's not <laughs> cricket, this is rounders. So it was played 500 years ago. Nine players, four paces, a leather-covered ball with bats. It had rest periods. They didn't call it innings, but that's pretty close to baseball. When the Pilgrims came here in 1620, you know, the first Thanksgiving turkey people, when they had their kids played rounders, a form of uh, baseball. Uh, by the time of the Revolutionary War, we had Americanized that game uh, into baseball. Uh, the, in fact, the first time it's called baseball, it was in 1774. For 1744, uh, there was an English poet who wrote a poem. Apparently, he played rounders, and he wrote a poem about the game of rounders, but for the first time, he called it baseball. In 1744, that's before this was a country. We don't become a country until 1789. George Washington's soldiers played it during the Revolutionary War. So did the British Army he was fighting. And in the Civil War, uh, both sides played baseball. But in 1876, get this down, the National League was formed, 1876. This is the beginning, and that's the beginning of professional baseball as we know it today, 1876. By the way, what other big event was happening in this great republic in 1876 that we've talked about? The Civil War. What? The Civil War. No, the Civil War's over in 1865. I'm talking about 1876. It had to do with the war. What? What did you say? Indian War. Yes, very good. And what great event in 1876 happened during the Indian Wars? What's the greatest event of the Indian Wars? Battle of Little Bighorn. Battle of Little Bighorn. Custer got wiped out. Well, about the time Custer's taking it on the chin out there, courtesy of the Cheyenne and the Sioux on that dusty Montana slope, they created the first baseball league and it was the national league can anybody here name me a national i'll see how many baseball fans anybody here name me a national league team you understand that all of baseball is divided into two leagues the national league the american league every year in october they play a series of games called the world series the world series seven games first team to win four is the national champion of the world in baseball so name me a national league team Atlanta. Name me an American League team. Anybody? Any guess? Pittsburgh Pirates. Pittsburgh Pirates. National League. I think the Pirates are National League. Yeah. Houston. Who? Houston. Yeah. They've been both. But I think they're currently American League. Can you think uh, of any team Giants. more? San Francisco Giants. San Francisco Giants. They're National League, I think. Yeah. Can anybody, can you name me a preeminent team that's an American League team? Very good team. Some people would say it's the best team that ever played the game. Yankees. New York Yankees. Boston. Okay. <laughs> and Boston. We're going to talk about Boston in a minute. Usually for this lecture, you see if you've flown and they have those little barf bags in case you get sick. Well, I'm going to talk about Boston, and I usually pass those out when I do. It'll make you sick. Anyway, speaking of Boston, get this down. The first World Series. By the way, 1882, the American League is formed. So you got the National and the American League. And the first World Series to determine who was the greatest team in baseball was played in 1903. It was Pittsburgh versus Boston, and who won the first World Series ever? Boston. Boston. Write that down. And then Boston won again in 1912. And I guarantee you up there in Beantown, that's what they call Boston, they were just ecstatic. Their team had won two World Series, and so they built their team a brand-new stadium, and it's the oldest – there it is. It's the oldest stadium in baseball. That's Fenway Park. Fenway Park. 
Uh, they still have, instead of the digital scoreboards, they have kids back there behind the scoreboard, and they still hang the numbers up, just like they did in 1912 when they moved in. Of course, the unique thing about this is if you look out, if you're batting here, and you look out at, uh, you look out at left field, uh, that part of the wall, left field wall, is higher than the rest, and they call that the green monster. Okay, the green monster. You've heard of that maybe? And to hit a home run over the green monster is quite a quite a to do. So there, there is Fenway Park, and bought, like, the, the fans of that's the oldest operating field in baseball, and the fans built that in 1912 because their team won the uh, the uh, World Series twice. Uh, and then they won it again in 1918. Boy, Boston was on a roll here, 1918. And uh, they had a player. Boston had a player out in center field, and he also pitched occasionally. And he was young, not very well known. But the New York Yankees, the arch rival of Boston, you know, the Yankees in Boston, that's like Texas and OU. They hate each other. Uh but they had a center fielder that sometimes came in and pitched as a relief pitcher uh, out in center field. And his name, uh, here he is when he was young. Uh, who is that? George Herman Ruth. Write him down. George Herman Ruth. The best known player in baseball. Some would say the greatest there ever was. The best known player in baseball, George Herman Ruth. And the Yankees wanted him. And there were two players. Let's show you how badly the Yankees wanted George Herman Ruth. There were two, there were two uh, uh, players, uh, or Boston said, we want two players that's on the New York Yankees team. And so Boston made that trade, two for one. Boston thought, boy, we took the Yankees to the cleaners. We got the best deal of that. And Babe Ruth went on to become a Yankee. And as they say, the rest the rest is history. Uh, and, of course, that was in 1918. Boston was on a roll. When was the next time that Boston won a World Series? After 1918. 2004. 80, they didn't win it after they traded away Babe Ruth. They didn't win another World Series for 86 years. And they blame trading Babe Ruth. If you go up to Fenway Park, you know, sit down up there with those Boston fans and say, what's this thing you people talk about up here called the curse of the Bambino? That's what they call it. We really shot ourselves in the foot, they say, when we traded away Ruth because we didn't win another World Series for 86 years. That's called the curse of the Bambino. Of course, that's just the excuse they made. Why did Boston really not win another World Series for 86 years. They suck that. Huh? Suck. What did I have? Your Boston sucks. So they didn't win another for another 86 years, okay? Had nothing to do with Babe Ruth. That's just an excuse they use, okay? Again, if you want verification of the things I'm telling you, go see Coach Green between classes. He'll verify everything I have to say. So anyway, uh, beginning during the Gilded Age, Baseball becomes America's national pastime. Who was the first African-American ever to play professional baseball, to play professional baseball? Jackie you Robinson. all know that. Jackie Robinson in 1946. Write this down. Jackie Robinson in 1946. Who did Jackie Robinson play for? The Dodgers. Who? The Dodgers. Which Dodgers? No. No, oh, they weren't in L.A. yet. The Brooklyn Dodgers. So write that down. The first African American to play professional baseball was Jackie Robinson in 1946. And he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And when you get that written down, strike a line through it because it ain't true. Scratch that out. Here's the first African American. Right, you write him down. There's the first African American to play professional baseball. Moses Fleetwood Walker. He was a catcher and he played. For a an American League team, <clears throat> he played for an American League team in 1884, called the to Toledo Blue Stockings. And, you know, in those days, the Red Sox were called the Red Stockings, the White Sox were called the White Stockings, the Toledo Blue Stockings. It was a professional team. It no longer exists, but it was. And uh, 
back to Babe Ruth. Anyway, uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker is the first African to be. I'll ask you that on the quiz tomorrow. And I don't know. Some of you will put Patrick Mahomes. But anyway, it's not. It's you know, just for the record. Uh, also, write this man down, Dr. Uh, James Naismith. Write him down. Which sport did he invent? That's bad book. Yeah. No, soccer. No, basketball. Okay. Interesting story. Dr. Naismith was a very, very busy man. Uh, he uh, uh, got a degree in physical education. Uh, he uh, got a degree in, uh, he, he was an actual medical doctor. Uh, and he was a, before it was all over, he was a Presbyterian minister. The first job he ever had out of college was at a YMCA, a young man's Christian association in Springfield, Massachusetts. And uh, he was in charge of all these teenage boys. And it was fine during the summer. You go outside in the spring, you could go outside. And they could, you know, let off all that excess energy. But in Massachusetts, the winters are long and they're cold. And uh, he was confined with those boys in this room uh, several months a year. And they got bored and then they got rowdy and then they started tearing the place down. And finally, his boss, the director of this YMCA, told him, uh, Naismith, I'm going to give you 14 days to come up with some sort of project, some sort of game, something these boys can play to keep them from tearing the place down. And in 14 days, he invented the sport of basketball. It had 13 rules. I don't know how many rules, but I'm not a basketball fan. I don't know how many rules basketball has today. But uh, the 13 rules started it, and eventually he will end up at the University of Kansas. You know, they're sort of good in basketball, the University of Kansas at Lawrence. Uh, he built the, the, them into a basketball powerhouse, and I guess they have been ever since. And that's where he's, he's buried. The first college football game, got this down, was in 1869, four years after the Civil War, 1869. And you don't have to write this down, but just for the record, the first college football game was played between Rutgers and Princeton, okay? Rutgers and Princeton. And Rutgers won that game six to four. Rutgers won that game six to four. Students often ask me, gee, how do you know that sounds like a baseball score? How did the how did the score turn out six to four? I've never been interested enough to look it up. You might if you want to, but it, that was the score. Six to four in the first college football game ever. Of course, it was a very different game than today. They didn't wear helmets. In fact, when are helmets required for the first time in football? What year? 1940. 19, there are people alive right now who were alive in 1940, so it's just one lifetime ago. And by the way, the face mask didn't have any of that protective gear on the front. It just had a helmet on your head. And then later in the 60s, when they start putting prog- protective gear on the front, it's just one single bar across that, okay? So today, you know, when they walk out on the field with all that stuff, they look like something out of a science fiction movie. They've greatly improved the helmet, okay? But anyway, I uh, got this down. Uh, Football was a violent game, still is, but it was certainly violent in those days. In fact, get this down, from 1900 until 1905, there's a football, there's a Gilded Age football. From 1900, there's a guy ready to go out and play. You know, imagine running out here and playing football like that. He's got a little padding, but that's no shoulder pads, no thigh pads, no hip pads, no nothing. You know, he's just got the ball in his arm, okay? Uh <laughs> And uh, that's – what is that? Rugby. No, somebody lost their contact. No, that's a, that's a rugby. It's called a scrum. That's how they started a rugby game. They set a ball down and they all pile around it. That's the way they played early football uh, on the line of scrim. They had a line of scrimmage, but that's the way they would start the game, uh, in a rugby scrum. Uh, and, uh, you know, from 1900 to 1905, get this down, 45 players died. 45 players were killed during the game. Now, don't you think about that just a minute. You know, we just had a young man in a professional game. I can't recall his name. I don't keep up with professional ball. But who's the young man that took – uh, huh? DeMar Hamlin. Ha- last name? Hamlin. Hamlin. Yeah. It caused him to have a massive stroke or heart attack. I don't know how old he is, 24, 25 years old, young. Uh, almost almost died. Of course, the whole country followed that. It was in all the news. It was in all the newspapers. And, of course, we're all rejoicing today because he's made a – He's making a full recovery, and I don't know if he'll ever play the game again. Have they, have they said that? Yeah. Is he going to play? Yeah. Well, good for him. Anyway, uh, the whole country fought it. Think about this. Think about if in the next five years, during football games, five uh, or excuse me, 45 college players got killed during the game. This country would be in an uproar. Well, 
1905, <coughs> a uh, running back, a fullback from Union College, a fullback from Union College named Harold Moore. Uh, you never heard of Harold Moore. I looked and looked for them. I can't even find a picture of Harold Moore. But Harold Moore played for Union College. He was a fullback. And, uh, you know, he had a following all over the country. He was as popular as uh, this uh, Patrick Mahomes, or is it Mahomes or Mahomes? Mahomes. Holmes, H-O-M-E-S. What? Mahomes, yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Patrick Mahomes, okay, was as popular uh, as Jalen Hurt or Baker Mayfield or Kyler Murray. He had a nationwide following. And Harold Moore was killed in a football game. I mean, he was just America's favorite football player, and he was killed. Someone kicked him in the head, which was perfectly legal, by the way. In fact, here is a game in progress. Look at that. There's the ball. There's the ball. Look at that guy. He's just kicking somebody, and that was perfectly legal. And when they kicked Harold Moore and killed him in a football game, uh, there was just a nationwide revulsion. A lot of people said, this is 1905. We ought to ban the game. You know, a lot of parents today say we're not going to let our kids play football because of the concussion issue. Well, uh, and some people say the game ought to be banned today because of the concussion issue. But anyway, there was a move. Get this down. In 19, it's a miracle that you're, you can watch college football because there was a strong move in this country. Just do away with it. It's too violent. Uh, it's too violent. Uh, and, um, you know, just as uh, Pre President Obama – not around 1905, but, you know, when he was president in 2014, there were concerns about the concussion issue. And President Obama called a football conference in the White House. He invited coaches and players, league officials, uh, and they all met in the White House. And they said, we got to make the game safer. And what did they outlaw in 2014? Targeting. What? Targeting and what else? Chop blocking. Yeah, you know, that was unheard of in football. Uh in fact, today there's a debate going on about the targeting thing because there's some people that say, well, if it's intentional targeting, you ought to throw the guy out, which is what they do. But if it's unintentional, maybe he sits out a quarter and there's a yardage penalty with it. They're arguing that right now, trying to make the game, trying to make a violent game safe. Well, I've got this down. In 1905, Theodore Roosevelt, shut that down, TR. Just like Obama in 2014 would call a conference, he called a, a conference at the White House. And by the way, Roosevelt was an avid fan of the game. He loved it. In fact, he had a son that played for Harvard. And just weeks before this, he called this football conference at the White House. His son had been hit. And according to the newspapers, as Teddy Roosevelt's son was being carried from the field, he was bleeding profusely. So he was severely imaged. But Roosevelt's determined, in spite of that, to save the game. And so uh, here's what they did. Get this down. And they call all these officials in and they adopt new rules. First of all, no more scrums. Both sides, there's a clear distinction between the two sides. There's a side, there's a line of scrimmage, a clear distinction between uh, both sides. Okay. They spread the teams out. None of this anymore. And then get this down. You could pass the ball. There had not been, you know, think about that. Football had been around since 1869. 1869, now it's 1905, and it was illegal. To, it was illegal. You could be penalized for throwing the ball. And in 1905, what they call the forward pass, the forward pass became legal. Up until that, you had to run the ball every time, and that, of course, inherently made the game more uh, or, or, or dangerous, Okay. Uh, so they adopt these new rules. And also they create this. Get this down. And by the way, Obama, I, I just want to make this clear because people just had to assign all sorts of things, powers to the president that the president doesn't have. Obama didn't call those people in in 2014 and said, listen, no more chop blocking. And they all said, okay. No, he just, they had a conference. And that's what they came up with. They didn't have to do any of that. The, 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 the football, football didn't have to say targeting is illegal. The president suggested that. The owners, the players, the coaches said that's a good idea, and they adopted that rule. The president didn't order that. Teddy Roosevelt didn't order the forward pass. It was suggested, and it became the law. Uh, and uh, also uh, in that, 
uh, they uh, this is the 1905 conference. Uh, the NCAA uh, was established, and it's still here. And the NCAA, it's, it's the National Colli the National Collegiate Athletic Association. Get that down. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, and they set the rules for football. They are the ones that do it. Presidents and popes and everything else can make suggestions, but they are the ones that make the decision. They regulate. They regulate football. Okay, so the NCAA and all that comes out of this fear that the game was uh, uncivilized. People called it barbaric, but college football. Thank goodness, I say, college football has survived. Although, let me just say this: as a longtime fan of college football, I think college football is going away. I think college football is just going to be a stage for future professional players to audition on. Uh, in other words, I think it's this, this portal. I just, I'm just, I just hate that. Uh, and I think uh, what they are doing um, is um, is just ruining ruining the game. I think it's you know the old. I'm old enough to remember when there were people like you know Rocky Kalmus and Steve Owens and uh, Greg Pruitt and a whole host of people that played at OU. Those kids grew up most of them in Oklahoma. And once in a while we had a Texan, but they grew up in Oklahoma and their goal in life was to play for the University of Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, that was really great college football. I think we're at the point now that you're not going to know who's playing until the kickoff. Uh, I think there are going to be people swapping teams in the locker room just before the OU Texas game. And I think that's, I think that's a real shame. That's just my opinion. Uh, that's my favorite sport. Well, I love baseball too, but my favorite sport is uh, college football. And I think it's, it's it's gone. I think it's it's not being destroyed. It's gone. But enough of that. Uh, anyway, got this down. Another great sport in the Gilded Age is boxing. <clears throat> By the way, boxing was an ancient sport. Get all this down. Boxing is an ancient was was it is an ancient sport. Are any of you boxing fans? Very good. When I was a boy, there were four channels on television, not two hundred. And my dad was a boxing fan. I never particularly cared for it, but he. Well, every Monday night, they had Monday night boxing. And guess which one of the four channels at the Thompson house was watched from about 9 o'clock till 10 o'clock. That was whatever channel boxing was on. I never cared for it, but it is an ancient sport. And by the way, get this down. It is called the Sport of Kings. Boxing is called the Sport of Kings. Okay. Goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks and Romans. It's 3,000 years old, boxing is. 3,000 years old. But, get this down, by the 1840s, were the 1840s in the Gilded Age? Were the 1840s in the Gilded Age? I think so. Huh? I think so. You think so? <laughs> when was the Gilded Age? Uh, 1865 to 1930. Until 1900. Get that in your head. We've been talking about, I've written that on the board a thousand times. You know, you can learn history, but if you don't know that World War II wasn't last week, it doesn't do you much good. You got, I'm not someone, when I was in school, they would write down 25 dates and you had to write whatever. Well, that's not, in my view, teaching history. That's a joke. But you got to have an idea that the Civil War was 150 years ago, not last Thursday. And the Gilded Age was about 150 years ago. Uh, so get this in your head, 1865 to 1900. And we are talking and have been for a while talking about the Gilded Age. We're about to leave it. We're approaching 1900. But the 1840s, that's pre, get this down, Civil War. Civil War is 1861 to 65. So the 1840s, 20 years before the Civil War. Okay? 20 years before the Civil War. Boxing, get this down, was a way, listen to what I'm saying, boxing was a way for immigrants who were in the 1840s. By the way, what's the greatest period of immigration in our history? When did more immigrants come here than any other period in our history? No, well, when was the Industrial Revolution? When did it really kick off? After the Civil War. After the Civil War. And what is it? 
What is that period of history called? I feel like I'm interrogating a witness. What? The Gilded Age is the greatest period of, of, of immigration. You with me? And we're going to talk all about immigration. <clears throat> but before the Civil War, 20 years before the Civil War, beginning in about 1845, get this down, the United States experienced its first great wave. Are you with me? Its first great wave of immigration. And who were they? Now think about this. Which people came here by the millions? The Irish. Write that down. The Irish come before the Civil War. By the way, why did they come here? Why did they leave that lovely little country called Ireland? What? They were hungry. They were starving to death. The potato crop in Ireland failed in the 1840s. This is before the Civil War, before the Gilded Age. The potato crop failed, and they were starving to death, and they came here. And when they were dumped out on the piers in places like Boston and New York City, they didn't look very good. They, didn't, they were in rags and tatters. They, were, uh, they didn't smell very good. They'd been crammed on those immigrant ships for weeks. And, when they stuck, and by the way, they're rural people. They're from rural Ireland, and they're dumped in the middle of a big city. You know, you have this, all these communication devices and all of this stuff. But if I, you know, if you were taken today and you were just dropped in New York City or Chicago on the street, I think that would be a pretty sobering experience for you too. Yeah. And imagine these people. Uh, and so their life was very, very difficult. And we'll talk more about that later. But their life was very difficult, as it is for most immigrants that come. But one way, get this down, in 1840, one way that an Irish kid stepping right off the boat could zip to the top, get this down, could go to the top, was by what? Boxing. Boxing. Write that down. If you were willing for somebody to put an X on a floor and another X right there and stand there with your arms up like this and that other guy's there and you can't move, you can just punch like that. If you were willing to do that and you could win doing it, you could zip to the top. And so the Irish... Uh, are some of the first great champions of boxing in the United States, okay? In fact, I'm going to put this up here. In fact, from about uh, 1845 until about 1930, the Irish are going to dominate the sport of boxing in America. By the way, which, I, you know, it's just, and, and, then, and then in 1930, uh, you know, African Americans, there's a boxer named Joe Lewis. He's called the Brown Bomber, and he becomes the world heavyweight champion. And from that period on to the 1990s, uh, African Americans pretty well dominate the sport. Uh, I watched uh, Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay when I was on the boxing channel. Sonny, my dad was a big Sonny Liston fan. And it was for the championship, and, and uh, the man then was Cassius Clay. He later <coughs> changed his name to Muhammad, and he converted to Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali, but his name was Cassius Clay. They asked him, why did you change your name? And he said, Cassius Clay was my slave name. So he changed his name to Muhammad Ali, but it just killed my dad when Muhammad Ali won, knocked out his favorite Sonny, Sonny Liston, both of them African-Americans. Anyway, two great boxers. Uh, but by the 1990s, and again, I'm speaking in broad general terms, which ethnic group really dominates boxing today, maybe? Hmm? Which group? I think it's Hispanic. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's the late. I think, now, that doesn't mean there aren't white champions and African-American champions and, you know, but I believe it's a, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, Hispanics, okay? I think they're pretty well. And, and that's, that's true to form. Now they're, they're the latest group of immigrants, okay? Well, I'll get this down. They didn't wear gloves. It was bare knuckle. And there was no limit on the rounds. A boxing match today, how many rounds? Twelve. Keep your three at 12 three-minute rounds. That's a regulation boxing match, okay? 
In those days, they had no limits. And you would simply step out, take your place, you, no footwork, you can't move. Take your place, head to head, and punch like that. Uh, in 18, let me get the date right. There's no need to note this down, but it just illustrates my point. In 1840, an Irishman named uh, Chris Lilly and another Irishman named Tommy McCoy fought 120 rounds, okay? And the only reason they stopped at 120 rounds is that Chris Lilly killed Tom McCoy. He literally beat him to death in front of an audience. That was the way for the Irish immigrants to get to the top, and a lot of them did it. Uh, that's a cartoon. There's death up on the goalpost and a pile of dead bodies, dead football players. Anyway, oh, speaking of football players, look at that real close. Look at this real close. I want everybody to pencil down. Look at this real close. Good. Evil. Everybody got that? Good. Texas, Texas. Uh, OU, <laughs> evil, <laughs> good. <laughs> First time I saw that picture, I didn't know if it was a football team or a prison break. But anyway, in 1889, get this down, 1889, this man, an Irishman, John L. Sullivan, riding down as the Boston strong man, the Boston bad boy, became the heavyweight champion of the world. And he got a big buckle, this big, to wear. And when he pulled into a town for a boxing match, he would go up to the biggest hotel, or he would go up to the biggest saloon, nicest saloon on Main Street, and walk in with that big, big belt buckle, and he'd slam it on the bar and turn around and say, I'm John L. Sullivan, and I can whip any man in the house. Then he'd step out in the street. I don't know if you ever had any takers or not. If he did have takers. He beat them. He beat them to a pulp. Okay, uh, John L. Sullivan, the heavyweight heavyweight champion of the world. Of course, he didn't take care of himself very well. Uh, in between rounds, you ever seen a boxing match? You know, they go sit on a stool and they put them, seal up their wounds and wash off their faces and give them something to drink. Well, he would uh, smoke cigarettes and drink beer between rounds. And eventually he ballooned up to about 300 pounds. And instead of a boxer, he was just more of a barroom brawler. I mean, he would just stand there and just pummel people. And the thing is, even though he got real fat and out of shape, uh, you know, he could, uh, I, I think he might've smoked sometimes while he was boxing, but uh, he could take people uh, pounding him. You know, it got to be pretty pathetic. I mean, he looked more like a mean drunk than a professional professional fighter at one point uh he was riding a train to his next match and he and a group of his friends were sitting in a train car and they were playing poker and drinking booze and he decided he had to pee so he gets up and for some reason he decides well i'm just going to go on on the back of the train and just pee off the back of the train and here they are out in the middle of nowhere and the train's just chugging along and he's back there peeing off the back of the train and all of a sudden the train took a sharp curve and he just fell off it's the heavyweight champion of the world. And they'd travel, and, you know, these guys are sitting there, well, I wonder where the champ is. Well, finally somebody goes, uh-oh, and they search the train and can't find him. So out in the middle of nowhere, they got to stop the train and light lanterns and back the train up and go out and find him. And they finally found him, I guess, all tangled up in the brambles and briars and dusted him off, put him on the train, and went to the next, went to the next fight, okay? Well, in 1892, get this down, in 1892, he was challenged by this young man, another Irish-American, Write him down, Jim Corbett, this gentleman, and write this down. They called him Gentleman Jim, Gentleman Jim Corbett. He was a um, edu he had a college degree. He's very different. You know, Sullivan's just a big old brawler, but this guy had a college degree. Uh, he had been an actor at one time. He had been a bank teller at one time. He was a sharp dresser. Uh, his parents were Irish immigrants. Um, but he spoke very precise English, and that's why they called him Gentleman Jim. And he said this. He developed, get this down, scientific boxing, okay? No more of this standing in one place and just beating each other senseless. 
In fact, uh, one has, as one historian said, he moved boxing from a brawl to a legitimate sport uh, because he introduced footwork. And if you look at a boxing match today, they don't stand still. They move all around the ring. Well, this is the guy that did that. And you can see he's not the biggest guy in the world, but he challenged John L. Sullivan. Uh, and uh, they fought in New Orleans in front of a crowd of 10,000 people. And when the bell rang, John L. Sullivan just stepped out like he always had. And this little guy just danced around him and beat the stuffings out of him and knocked him out in the 21st round. Just a second. Knocked him out in the 21st round, and he became known as the man who whipped, uh, I can whip any man in the house, John L. Sullivan. Well, get this down. Sports, though, get this down. Sports, all of them, like the, and, and including boxing, like the rest of the nation was thoroughly segregated. You know, you had a, you had a white professional baseball league. You had a black professional baseball league, the same in football and the same in boxing. You had a white national heavyweight champion and you had a black national heavyweight champion. Well, in 1897, get this man down, Jack Johnson, 1897, he became – the black heavyweight champion of the world. Get all this down. He was from Galveston, Texas. His father. Hayden, phone corner, please stop by the office. His father had been a slave. And he was called the Gal he's from Galveston, Texas. He was called the Galveston Giant. I'll ask you that tomorrow. Who, which boxer was called the Galveston Giant? And some of you will put, I don't know, Baker Mayfield. Uh, but it wasn't. It was Jack Johnson. At the same time, get this down, the white heavyweight champion was this man, Jim Jeffries. Write him down. Jim Jeffries. Jim Jeffries. And when we come back tomorrow after your quiz, we will take it up there.